Welcome to Kaiser Watch with John Kaiser. I'm your host, Jim Goddard. Welcome back to the show, John. Jim, pleasure to be back on the show. John, how have sanctions against Russia affected commodity prices? You know, on Monday was Monday was an absolutely crazy day. Uh, nickel shot to $21 after closing around $13 a pound on Friday. Oil was up to $130, $39 a barrel. And what's going on is there are there is more than just sanctions, sanctions at play. There's the official sanctions, but they don't include sanctions against oil or 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 or, or any other en- or natural gas, you know, energy type type uh, commodities uh, because the rest of the world still needs these commodities, especially Europe, which is very much dependent on 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 Russian natural gas exports. And the United States and the and the United Kingdom have both now banned the import of Russian oil. But that's kind of meaningless because both are producers of oil and they don't import much Russian oil at all. And it whatever they used to import, it just gets uh, diverted theoretically elsewhere. But the price of everything is going up because of restrictions on uh, materials being exported from, from Russia. Now, the interesting thing that's happening is the so-called self-sanctioning. Uh, the world is reacting so negatively to what Putin has done to the Ukraine that, that people aren't waiting for instructions to tell them, oh, you can't buy this Russian good anymore. They're voluntarily avoiding it. And one of the areas where there's a big problem is in the traders who are dealing with these commodities. Uh, they are avoiding them because they see that uh, the, the financial restrictions, the United States has in effect declared financial war on Russia, and it right now is winning this war. Russia is being completely isolated. They can't transact anything. And everybody on the outside has been avoiding this this Russian oil. So this Russian oil is ending up sitting in these super tankers, floating around the world, waiting for this mess to end. And this happened in 2009. The oil had cranked to almost $150 a barrel in 2008 before the the crash in, in September, and it got below forty dollars. Was in the thirty forty dollars, and uh, traders were buying this oil and literally storing it on these floating uh, super tankers that just went around and around in the circle because there was no no on on land storage for this oil, and demand had completely fallen back after the crash. And their speculation turned out to be correct because within a year. Oil was back over seventy dollars and peaked at about one hundred and fifteen in twenty eleven. Before finally, uh, uh, gr- um, w- when there was a slow global slowdown after China's big uh, stimulus post crash stimulus came to an end, uh, then it finally fell back below fifty fifty dollars a barrel. But what we have now is a different situation where it it isn't that uh, it's it isn't that demand has disappeared. It's that the supply has been taken offline. And so we're seeing uh, higher prices in all these commodities across the board because, like, literally, this oil is just going around in a circle. Now, countries like China are probably buying this oil, this dirty oil, at a discount, like it's a black market good. And so they're investing for a return to normalization. Now, this is an interesting situation in China itself. Uh, you know, at the start of the Olympics, uh, Winter Olympics in Beijing, Putin, de- uh, uh, Xi Jinping declared that uh, China and Russia were big pals and they were supportive of Putin's efforts to protect Russia against uh, an invasion by NATO and the United States and, and Europe. But I don't think he quite expected Putin to do what he did or the Ukrainians to react in the way that they did or even the rest of the world rather than just accept some dirty compromise so that business can go go back to normal as soon as possible. Yeah, tough luck for the Ukrainians, just just suck it up. The outcome has been completely different. Putin is now trapped in a corner. He has no exit. The destruction he has done to, to, to buildings and, and civilians, uh, it's, it's off the scale. There is no forgiveness coming. Uh, Russia, if it ends up uh, standing down, it will end up being forced to pay for the restoration of all the damage that it has done, it's going to be a long time 
before Russia has any serious standing in the rest of the world, unless there is a revolution in Russia where there's finally a proper overthrow of this authoritarian dictatorship that snuck back into place after night the Soviet Union collapsed in, in 1991. And, and China itself, of course, has, uh, has mutated back into a very authoritarian system. Both countries now have turned their communication system into self-enclosed, isolated bubbles where the only information that's allowed to circulate is that which is controlled from top down. And China's watching what's going on, and they can see that within Russia, the information is seeping in. The Russian people don't understand what this nonsense is all about. Yes, out in the, in the rural part, uh, uh, they, they may think this is great what's going on, believe anything that Putin says. But at some point, Russia will implode. So this relationship uh, Xi Jinping has forged with Russia, where it's, it's pal, it's buying up the oil and stockpiling it uh, for later, this is going to create some sort of blowback down the road. Now, the fact that the Russian economy is now isolated, uh, they can't pay for anything, their, 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 their foreign reserves have been, central bank reserves have been, foreign reserves have been, been frozen now, uh, it doesn't really affect the global economy a big deal because Russia is only 1.7% of the global economy. But t China's economy is 10 times bigger. Russia is largely an exporter of raw material, so the prices go up and we do without and we tighten our belt. But China's economy is very much integrated with the rest of the world. And I think the, uh, the, the elephant in the room right now is the problem Xi Jinping has created for himself. He thinks he's a shoe in for a third term in the National Congress in November. Well, I'm willing to speculate that in November, he is the fall guy for everything that's going wrong. And COVID's now out of control in Hong Kong, and they're going to shut this down in a, in a manner that's never been seen before, even in the rest of China. And the COVID will get on, into mainland China, and that's going to be visible. And also, that as the cost of goods go through the roof, the, the, the Chinese people are also going to see that, and they're going to wonder wonder why this is going on. Oh, yeah, it's because you backed Putin, said, I'm your bud. Yeah, go ahead, do all these things. Really, was that necessary? So I think Xi Jinping is probably history. And, of course, the speculation is that he will attempt to annex uh, Taiwan. But uh, they're watching how the Ukrainians are fighting. The Taiwanese are waking up and saying, whoa, these guys at least can't pour across the border the way the Russians did. Uh, they're going to have to come here by boat or paratrooper. And uh, I think we're going to be ready for them. And, and we kind of like our own little nation, uh, our own identity, our own freedom. So we are going to resist also in a big way. So whatever Xi Jinping was planning, uh, to take advantage of uh, during this uh, uh, Ukrainian situation. I think that's out the window. And uh, as far as the, the metal prices, when you look at the, what, uh, what Russia dominates in, uh, look at the ones that they provide more than 10%. There's antimony, uh, where they're almost 20% of global supply. That hasn't really gone up yet, but that's because it's a bit of an opaque market, and China is the dominant supplier of that. Uh, uh, diamonds, nobody actually needs a gem diamond. We can all live without it. But here's where the self-sanctioning is also kicking in. People are saying, I don't want a Russian diamond. If I want a natural diamond, I want one from a country that isn't the thug that beats up uh, in a innocent uh, people. So suddenly, the price of diamonds is going up because Russian diamonds are being shunned. And of course, source certification, which was introduced uh, several decades ago through the Kimberley process, uh, when all these uh, 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 warlords were uh, terrorizing the uh, people in, in, in places like Sierra Leone and forcing them to uh, harvest these diamonds from the fields, from the rivers, and then selling them into the market. Uh, uh, the market became conscious of, you know, I want to know where my stone came from. Did it come from Canada, Botswana, where it's properly produced? And, of course, there's technology that allows you to uh, actually scan a diamond, a polished diamond, and know exactly what it looks like. It, it's fingerprinting. So so diamonds have turned into collectibles. And the, uh, the Russian diamonds, uh, well, if you, you, you classify them as a Russian diamond, nobody really, really wants them. Um, 
Palladium, of course, is a huge problem. It's now at the highest price it's ever been. It touched through $3,000 an ounce. Palladium is used primarily for gasoline, gasoline-powered uh, uh, cars for the catalytic converters, whereas platinum, it's used for the diesel, the diesel uh, engine-powered cars. And, and Russia also produces about 13% of global platinum. So, so platinum has started going up, but palladium is way up there. And this is a big problem. If they cannot smuggle the palladium out of Russia, all these cars that are supposed to be finished off with the proper catalytic converters, they're going to be stranded. And these are many of these knock-on effects from little things that are really creating a mess in the global economy. And, and we're stuck now, going to be stuck with persistent inflation that uh, uh, is not going to go away from raising interest rates because, yes, that will induce a recession, but it's still going to uh, not make uh, uh, the, the demand fall so drastically uh, that it takes care of the supply that has been withdrawn. You know, and another surprise is vanadium. Um, 20, 21% of vanadium comes from Russia, and China itself is the biggest producer. And that, it had run to $60 during that 2016-18 first wave of a clean energy bubble when, when metals like cobalt and vanadium and lithium had their first run. It had run to $60 a pound, but it crashed back into the $10, $20 per pound. That's now rising $26 a pound. And the vanadium's, uh, you know, it's a steel hardener, but it's also uh, an emerging use is, is in these uh, long-term storage batteries. So th these price hot rises are affecting a lot of things that are supposed to be helping with the clean energy transition. The, the, the one positive thing about these very high fossil fuel prices that we are seeing is that uh, uh, this will help, not right now, but in the longer run, encourage a shift away from fossil fuel reliance, especially when these fossil fuels come from countries that are increasingly leaning towards autocracy. And potash, of course, is, is the big elephant in the room that's uh, freaking everybody out. That has the potential to reduce crop output because the potassium affects the health of crops. So it, it doesn't boost yield, but it will cause yield to decline if there's insufficient potassium fertilizer put in the soil. Belarus potash is now not going anywhere. And the Russian potash, it's now bogged down in logistics because of this problem we talked about last week, that ships are not landing in Russian ports to pick up goods. They don't want the complications. They're staying away. So a lot of these raw materials that Russia is producing are being stranded. And I've just heard that uh, the CFR potash, landed potash in Brazil, has now hit $1,000 a ton for KCL. That's the peak that was hit in 2008. And this is before the last of the ships that are still trundling out on the ocean arrive in Brazil 30 days from now when there will be no more Belarusian or Russian potash heading in. And the farmers in Brazil are freaking out over that. And it's interesting, uh, the, the agriculture minister was on the air the other day talking about, uh, uh, well, we have, we're going to have to do something about this potash supply. And she talked about this Amazon deposit uh, uh, that will take a you know, number of years to develop. And she did not mention at all Verde Agritech's solution. And we talked about last week uh, that they're now going to double the capacity of the plant two to 2.4 million tons. That'll be 3 million tons operational sometime by the fourth, fourth quarter of this year, full 3 million tons operational in 2023. The stock actually went down this week on, on Monday as, as some traders, when the New York peeled off 800 points, some, some traders said, oh, this could get really ugly. Uh, uh, the, 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 the technicals are suggesting that we could have a bigger 20% plus plunge. There looks like no end in sight to this uh, Russian-Ukraine Ukraine situation. And so uh, Verde Agritech, which was around $9, uh, it's traded as low as $6 uh, 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 in, in the past few days which is very good for the company because hardly anybody knows about it. Not even the Brazilian Minister of Agriculture, Teresa Cristina, 
knows about Verde Agritech, which is not a total solution, but it's going to be a significant solution in the long run. And uh, so, so for, for little juniors like our favorite Verde Agritech, this is all really good news. But nickel, that is the crazy one. The LME suspended trading on Monday. It has yet to resume. There is a short squeeze underway. And uh, it's not just affecting the, the big player, which we, which, which we can talk about later, but it's also affecting other parties who have short positions on. And when you see a move of, of $8, $9, that's unprecedented in the commodity markets. They're trying to figure out how to resolve this nickel problem. Obviously, nickel needs to come down, but it's not clear how easy it will be for the nickel price to come down. So what's going on with the nickel market and what does it mean for FPX nickel? FPX nickel, I talked about it last week. It was sort of in that 60, 70 cent range. And I said, you know, this, this stock deserves to be $1.50, $2.50 uh, a share just based on what we already know. And that $7.75 per pound nickel price that was used as the base case in the PEA that they published in in late 2020. They're working on a pre-feasibility study, which will tighten all the uh, error margins. And they've done work on showing that this ferro-nickel concentrate that we produce, uh, it, uh, it, it can be turned into nickel sulfate, battery grade nickel directly without having to have any other special processing. And we'll get further confirmation about that. So the stock started waking, waking up and uh, it went into the 80, 80, 90 cent range. And yes, it's pulled, it's pulled back uh, in, in the last day or so. But the market's waking up that here is a long term solution that will pl- provide clean stainless, clean, clean, clean nickel for stainless steel and also be able to supply the nickel sulfate needed by the uh, battery market if nickel remains part of the uh, battery convi- con- configuration it becomes the the reality in 2030 when the the electric vehicle market is set to go mass market exponential now there's a certain irony in the uh, uh short squeeze that's happening right now because apparently the party that uh, is short a big amount of LME nickel is Xingshan Holding Group, which is a major Chinese stainless steel producer. And uh, the individual, his name is uh, Jiang Wangda. Uh, he is apparently the, the brains behind putting on a short position in the LME to offset, to hedge against the output in Indonesia. Now, now this com- company is very interesting because when nickel shot to 25 bucks uh, in, in 2007, uh, uh, that was all mainly when the market was dependent on refined nickel in places like the, the LME and the and, and the Shanghai uh, warehouses, and 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 the, those inventories had dropped very very low during that period. And then of course there was the supply demand imbalance and the price spike. But Xingsheng developed a way of taking low grade laterite ore putting it into a rotary kiln and converting it into nickel pig iron with a sufficient uh, 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 qual- quality to be fed into their stainless steel mills to make a lower quality stainless steel, but a quality good enough for, for, for Chinese applications. And, and that helped to destroy the nickel market uh, in 2009, 10, uh, uh, as the nickel pig iron took off. Indonesia and the Philippines, they became the dominant suppliers. Even, even today, Indonesia is 37% of global supply, followed by, uh, by, by the uh, Philippines with 14%, and then comes Russia with about 10, 10, 11%. Now, Russia makes refined nickel that ends, smelted nickel that ends up in the LME warehouses. But what happened about four or five years ago is Indonesia got annoyed that all this raw laterite ore was simply being mined and put on barges and truck and shipped to China where it was put into the rotary kilns there. 
and made into nickel pig iron. So they created a moratorium and said, if you guys want to do this, you need to do it onshore here in Indonesia. So there was this period where the Chinese companies like Xingchan invested lots of capital to build these smelters and processing facilities. And Xingchan now makes a nickel mate, which is not as high quality as LME refined nickel, but it's good enough for a lot of applications. And and last year, when nickel was taking off during the first quarter, when everybody was celebrating the, the clean energy uh, uh, uptrend, Xingjiang put out some news that's saying that we figured out a way to make nickel sulfate from our nickel mate. And of course, they're making this from all their uh, uh, low-grade uh, 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 laterite deposits in, in Indonesia. And this tanked the market because Right now, the main way to make nickel sulfate is to take refined LME-grade nickel and reprocess it to make nickel sulfate. So it means the cost of nickel sulfate is going to be higher than the refined nickel. And and the, the LME warehouse stocks aren't as important as they used to be uh, because this nickel pig iron material that's uh, produced by, by by these Chinese operators in Indonesia it bypasses the warehouses and goes directly to the steel mills. And the the uh, ferro-nickel, 65% nickel concentrate that FPX nickel would produce from, from, from the car, it would also never end up in the warehouses because it would be a direct feedstock for stainless steel mills. So the irony is that it appears that Xingxiang has gone short a huge amount which has been offset by a mysterious stockpiler who has accumulated a large part of the, uh, you know, short positions. And the problem Xingxiang has, it can't deliver its product to settle the LME standard that it's gone short. And what's really messed them up is that the Russian LME nickel is not coming into the system. So this has created a a tremendous squeeze with the Chinese uh, stainless steel maker caught offside and everybody else who was piggybacking on this trade thinking nickel's not going to hang around here. Uh, they are all caught in a serious short squeeze while the Russian uh, uh, refined nickel is basically stranded and not arriving in the warehouses. How does this benefit FPX nickel? Well, very high prices always gain eyeballs. So people are looking at this Yes, it's not a long-term sustainable price, but they're seeing there are these problems, and then they're looking at alternative solutions. It's just like with Verde Agritech. Uh, you know, three years ago, nobody really cared that they had an alternative potash product called K4. Uh, now they care a lot, and now with this ferro nickel, people were worried. Oh, yeah, well, it's a specialty product that only certain stainless steel makers will want it. But yeah, you can make battery grade directly from that. Uh, uh, nickel sulfate, that's going to be really interesting. So this crisis in the nickel market is helping put eyeballs on FPX nickel, just as the potash crisis is putting eyeballs on Verde Agritech. And while it's not going to change overnight, we are now seeing these companies, which have fundamentally different innovative uh, uh, sources of raw material, they're going to catch a huge wave of interest that will persist even if nickel is finally allowed to trade again and comes back. And if, uh, you know, potash may hit 1500 2000 bucks a ton before anything settles up, but it's going to come back to a lower level. And these companies, they're going to flourish. This is this Russia crisis, sad as it is for Ukrainians and, and all the knock-on effects everywhere, these are putting these companies, which are part of the whole sort of clean energy revolution, they, it, they're, it's putting them into the limelight. Why was your bottom fish pick, Bell Copper, up last week? The company in mid-February put out a news release saying that Crestcat Capital was going to exercise $1.7 million worth of 25-cent warrants and that other places from earlier private placements had also uh, exercised about $1.1 million uh, worth of, of uh, warrants so that the company in February had got a $2.7 million cash injection 
to help fund its big sandy exploration drilling program. Now, when we introduced Bell Copper earlier this year, we talked about how it had escaped from that sort of 15, 20, 25 cent range after the company reported that it had intersected several hundred meters of calcosite mineralization in the bedrock, uh, pretty much in the area there where they think there is the truncated top of a major porphyry system that has slid sort of 14, 15 kilometers eastwards from its source where just the roots are exposed to the west. And I talked to uh, Tim Marsh, the, the CEO, about this. And one of the things that struck me was that he said, you know, I don't think this is that we're sitting on top of the primary porphyry system, the, the porphyry, the copper shell, that this uh, calcocyte mineralization would have, uh, you know, emerged from as rainwater circulates through the system, dissolves the calcopyrite, the primary sulfite, and then reprecipitates it, it to create a copper-enriched blanket with the calcocyte type of type of sulfide, which uh, although it's a sulfide, it lends itself well to uh, you know SXCW operations, and because when they went through the calcocyte, there was uh, you know a different type of rock present that did not have the degree of calcopyrite needed to allow what they were seeing in that blanket evolved. And it also became clear to me that uh, what they were likely reading with their XRF unit was that this blanket was not the sort of 0.65% or higher that you're going to need for an underground block caving operation. It is probably lower. And, and Tim floated the idea that he thinks this is more a lateral precipitation effect. It is not the classic where you have the the, 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 the zone, the, the primary zone, and the, uh, the rainwater circulates through it, and it just dissolves, sinking down lower and lower, concentrating the re-precipitated, re-precipitated copper. This is more of a sideways flow, and uh, that means that the, this 2400 uh, by 2100 meter MT target that we have, which we think is this, uh, this porphyry system, it's probably off in the direction of which our hole is drilling. And they were down to about uh, you know, 1,400 meters or so. And what the big news that came out uh, uh, last week, which got the stock moving, was that after going through this uh, not-so-great material, they did start hitting calcopyrite primary mineralization. Now, this is an angled hole on a drill that can go to a maximum depth of 2,000 meter, and, and Tim described it as we are gradually entering a pyritic, uh, not pyritic, uh, the, the, the primary uh, uh, porphyry system, which is also code for saying we're on the edge of it. And so this hole itself is probably not going to qualify as that no-brainer, uh, 1% uh, uh, copper type intersection, but what it is really confirming is Tim's hypothesis that the uh, the angle of this hole is going to point towards the uh, vertical zone, nick it, and then confirm that uh, where this other hole that we want to drill, the, the uh, 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 hole 3A, which would be angled in the in, in the other western direction, would intersect uh, the bedrock about 500 meters over, and Likely, what this now means is that that will hit the calcocyte blanket where it sits right above the primary copper sulfide mineralization. So it has the potential to be very enriched. Uh, by now, they had about 80 meters left to go before they hit the edge of the, the limit of the drill. They're going to push it until they either uh, ran out of uh, uh, calcopyrite mineralization or the drill just couldn't push it any further, stop the hole, and uh, and then then immediately start from the same drill pad this hole 3A, and it only has to go about a thousand meters or so, 1,200 meters to hit the uh, the bedrock uh, and and the, where the calcosite blanket is likely to be. So we won't have to hopefully wait quite as long. It will still take six six weeks. But the reason instead of pulling this hole 
and starting right away with this other one. The reason he persisted with hole three is if he could keep this going and confirm where that edge of the system is, then he knows that that hole uh, 3A is going to hit the bullseye. And also hole 4, which is 900, planned for 900 meters south there, that's the permitting that drill pad, um, and, and who knows how long that will take. Uh, now they know that when they drill this second hole uh, designed to intersect 500 meters to the west, this has the potential to deliver the discovery interval. So the market's reaction wasn't, you know, oh, we have a no-brainer barn burner uh, discovery hole. No, we have very strong contextual information that that we do have this big, hopefully sufficient copper grade to support an underground uh, deposit, the very large footprint, uh, you know, bill, billion ton type system. And this could end up being a world class discovery. The stock hasn't gone to the moon because we still need that hole in there to confirm that, yes, we do have this very high grade, large copper discovery. But with the news that they'd raised $2.7 million, all of the various grinder brokerage firms and all that they've been told, no, we don't want to raise money yet. We're going to wait for these results. And of course, this hole has, has been very closely monitored by, by Freeport, which owns the uh, nearby Baghdad mine, and then they, they take water rights from that area to keep that mine operating. And then others like BHP, whose efforts to break into the American copper sector have been stymied. They bought a piece of the uh, resolution project from Rio Tinto, and that's stalled right now because of uh, protests uh, from from, from uh, Na Native American groups. Uh, so BHP is probably in the wings watching for this. So this Bell Copper, uh, with that news, it took us a big step closer to the possibility that we might have an emerging world-class discovery in Arizona owned by a little persistent junior whose other project, the Perseverance on which they'd worked for you know, a dozen years or so in Cordoba Minerals, is now drilling, <laughs> ironically, has been named Perseverance. And that hole apparently is still drilling. Friedland's group is still drilling that. They're not letting any information out. Apparently, they did have some difficulties uh, with the drillers or, or, or the drilling conditions. So there's still a potential surprise coming from the Perseverance project where some big MT targets are also the uh, uh, focus for the drilling. John, thank you so much for the update. You're welcome, Jim. We've been talking with John Kaiser. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on Kaiser Watch are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as a recommendation to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at kaiserresearch.com.